good afternoon and thank you so much and um, welcome to the panel this afternoon. Thank you so much to Nicole and Phil from Vertical Crypto Art for inviting us to um, talk about digital fashion. I'm very honored to be chairing the event this afternoon. Um, I am joined by James Joseph. Anara, Ashumi, Marco. They're all gonna do a little intro for you guys in a second. We're gonna be talking for about 30 minutes and then we're gonna do like 10 minutes of questions because I always love the questions from the audience. Um, and I'm Hollywood, so um, I was at Rarible, past tense previous, previously at Rarible as head of artist relationships. Recently launched hollywoodlabs.io, um, which is a new Web3 consultancy and curatorial studio. Um, mostly working with luxury fashion brands at the moment. I did think for one moment, do I wanna kind of like specialize in fashion? But actually the thing I love about Web3 is kind of like breaking boundaries and new spaces. I'm not a gamer, I'm not into gaming. I haven't worked in the music industry having been in creative industries for 20 years. So actually I'm not gonna kind of like confine myself to fashion because I think like those arenas are super exciting in this space in particular. Um, but I think some of those topics will end up covering just because fashion definitely is crossing over a lot of these um, other kind of genres in Web3 that were these different verticals that we're kind of like seeing to develop. Um, so yeah, if you guys would be happy to intro yourselves very quickly, and then we're going to get started. One, one day we're going to get you to intro all of us. <laughs> that'll, that'll happen <laughs> one day. Um, so I, I founded Cyber Magazine, um, which we're revolutionizing media by merging digital and physical. So we've got a physical magazine, but it's augmented reality enabled. So you scan the pages with your phone and you have 3D uh, augmented reality uh, bring the pages to life. So. For example, our latest cover we did um, with a musician, Teflon Sega, who signed to Empire, and we debuted his newest song on the cover of the magazine by having a 3D model of him performing with the song playing, et cetera. Um, and we're also uh, very involved with digital fashion. We just launched our latest, which was a, an AI designed t-shirt, which then has augmented reality uh, enabled on top of that as well. Um, and we just uh, closed pre-seed funding. So we're now uh, led by Red Dow, who are obviously the largest uh, digital fashion DAO. Um, so we'll be moving uh, our direction even more into digital fashion as we continue. If you haven't gotten your copy of Cyber Magazine, I highly recommend you do. Um, my name is Anara. I am the VP of Metaverse at Hype Partners, which is a Web3 marketing agency. We've been around since 2017, so that's before the first major crypto winter. Um, and uh, on the side, I also am a founder of a digital fashion platform called Armoire. The goal, really, I think for all of us is that we have so much that we would like to do. So working with brands is quite different from working on something of your, of your own in an emerging space. So we've got insights from some of the projects we've worked on and then also some of the things that we truly believe in and want to see in the future. So this will be a very exciting conversation. Um, so I'm Ashmi. I'm the founder and CEO of Mad Global. Uh, we're a creative production uh, agency focused on innovation. We start. I started the company in 2009 and have focused primarily working with fashion, luxury, and art clients. We've been working in the Web3 space for the last three years and uh, initially got into the space also doing a lot more projects in the Createch space with augmented reality, VR, 3D, and now also advise across a lot of different Web3 projects. We also do a lot of projects um, IRL. So for example, we've worked of course with Mikola Vertical Crypto Art. We, the first event we did with them was Proof of People and then we're doing this. Um, we really believe in actually bringing together what it is we're building in digital spaces into physical event activations as well, because having a shared experience with community is so pivotal in moving the space forward. I'm really excited to be here today with some of the OGs in the space. So it's always uh, nice and to see familiar faces in the audience. Thank you so much for being here with us. Hey, uh, sorry for my voice. They, they told me actually, I, uh, it looks good for podcast over Christmas songs as well if you want um yeah so i'm a marco the city of the fabricant the fabricant uh, is on digital fashion since 2018 a kind of pioneer on that field uh, was the first company to mint on ethereum uh, digital fashion uh, nft in 2019 
And since then, we collaborate with uh, several brands uh, and, and creator. And it's one year that we are building our own platform called Studio, where we want uh, everyone to co-create digital fashion with us. So super excited about today and, uh, and this week. So thanks for being here. So I really wanted to start off with kind of like thinking about you know, it is called a deep dive into Web3 fashion. I don't know about you guys, but when I first kind of like heard the term Web3 fashion, I don't know, it made me feel really, I, I, I don't know how comfortable I was with that. Having spent like such a long time in the fashion space and it kind of like, you know, I really look up to so many of those kind of creators that have like um, expanded our horizons creatively at different brands in particular you know you're thinking about what Demna does at Balenciaga and you know there's it's fashion is kind of like rooted in revolution so when we talk about web3 fashion what are we actually talking about or how do you kind of like perceive it now and maybe how did you originally perceive it or and what's the relationship between web2 and web3 fashion and what that's for all of you guys um, I think uh, collaborative is the angle that is kind of new. The fact that uh, brands needs to be uh, needs to involve more co their communities, their users, their their customers. So let's say that we don't call any more customers because they give up on the fact that they are just selling a product. But there is this aspect that really needs to be more structured and more visible. To the community and that's i think is when i say web3 fashion i i immediately realize we're talking about uh, we're talking about things that there are about that needs to be collaborative and the users are owners also of what they got and that's a bit the big difference there so. I would say that there was already a phenomenon happening that needed a name. So Web3 is what we called it, but there was a whole generation of people that have played games and lived semi-virtual existences online that started to kind of decorate their virtual selves and their virtual spaces. So the designers that kind of call themselves digital fashion designers now, a lot of them have never studied fashion. They've never gone to college, but they make beautiful things and they have a knowledge of pattern making and they understand you know, how to think outside the box. And there's this weird moment where brands are actually looking towards this new segment of creators and thinking, okay, what should we be doing then? Now that this is developing, now that these tools are available, how does our brand fit into this narrative and vice versa? So it's it has this name that we nicknamed Web3 Fashion, but I think it's more of like a an emergence or maybe transformation of the gaming sector and as it seeps into other sectors and other industries. Yeah, I also think it's it's just that it's not a new way. And like Inara said, it's just it's something that has been happening for a long time. And, you know, we kind of have termed it uh, Web3. But when the Internet was the Internet, no one said it was Web1 or yeah. Web2. And now we're Web3. It's just a new iteration of how we're going to engage in new digital spaces and how we're going to connect with people you know of course how we consume content is changing from 2d to 3d and how we're actually going to change the way we um, extend let's say our physical um, expressions of using fashion as an expression of how we express ourselves into digital spaces as well so i think it's just going to be an extension of what we are in the physical sense going into digital spaces a lot more people of course are connecting into this that have maybe not been part of the game gaming world or gamers in a sense but it's just becoming more mainstream now yeah i mean i think if you think about media in a sense like we were in the world of the social graph and now we're in the era of the interest graph and then with that comes the the creator economy and i think the creator economy is a huge part of web3 fashion right like it, it has to be there without it it doesn't really exist and then the other thought that i have is about ownership um because in reality if you think about Fortnite, uh is that web3 in the sense of it's a metaverse people are buying skins which is fashion basically uh, but then a company is making two to three billion dollars a year out of all its consumers so it's definitely not web3 because there's no ownership so i think ownership has to be a huge part of it i think like you see these things like Fortnite, roblox but starting out there's no ownership and that's where Web3 comes into it. Okay, so that leads me on very nicely to talking to Anara about the fashion DAO. 
and like how that kind of like infrastructure like can change how um, fashion institutions are created, what's their purpose, how they operate um, in the sense of like how creators can then engage in being part of that process. And I think it ties into what you were saying, Marco, about collaboration. But yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the fashion DAO because there's not so many fashion DAOs around. So I'm excited for yours. Yeah, I think when we look at tech in general, it has been steady on its course to infiltrate every single industry, whether you started by setting up a website for your business to then have it making an app for your business to then finding other ways of how you're going to incorporate technology to deliver your products and services. I think crypto, NFTs, DAOs, blockchain has has offered a fundamentally different idea of how we create and exchange value. So it's not even just about the conception of the products themselves or the delivery method, but it's also how are you planning on engaging with your customer base? So every time somebody votes with their dollar, choosing your product over others, these are people that that make up your market share. But for the longest time, kind of what uh, James was just saying, companies had a top-down approach of generating value, capturing most of it, and it was built off of the backs of its participants. So fashion is no different. That's how it just mimics the business models of most industries. So with the idea of a DAO, it is essentially an attempt to reorganize the way that we conceive and build products, the way we form teams and how they go, go out into the world. This model, I have used this analogy before, people seem to like it. Um, DAOs remind me of group projects. And if you reflect back on your time making group projects or doing group projects in school, they're quite difficult. Motivating people to stay on top, somebody's always pulling more weight than others. So DAOs definitely have their own issues and their own opportunities. But the idea is that it's no longer a vision of one person. And that's kind of what brands are. It's a vision of one company dictating to you what is or isn't fashionable. And people don't want that anymore. They want more of a conversation and they want to use structures for DAOs to conceive different products and actually have an input of what they want to see in the market. Maybe that means more pre-sale. Maybe that means sourcing global talent from all over the world instead of people that live in fashion capitals like London, Paris, New York. There's people everywhere that could contribute to the ecosystem. And DAOs are just an operational model of making it possible for them to create things and also earn an income. It is very early on in this idea. I think people experimenting with DAOs as an investment mechanism, as a creation mechanism, as like a tool to even like get people to agree on certain things and vote. So big experiment happening now. If you're interested in it, start participating, observing, contributing. But I definitely have more questions than answers at this point. And Marco, you just launched the whole land at the Fabricant. Yeah. We need a little alpha and low down on that for us it's all secret but, this, this but. could be like your twitter thread <laughs> in real life yeah it's all secret but okay uh yeah the world land is our new experience it's gonna unfold in different let's say chapters and episodes uh we're gonna launch uh in the beginning of next year with the first phase and we're gonna have uh, probably uh, whitelist i hate the whitelist in general but we need to because it's still like i think it's important that we keep uh, close technology uh, one problem of uh, all these blockchain and crypto nft is uh, technology is still uh, like a bless but also a, a issue so and making things just open to everyone is is challenging it's challenging for security to keep our community safe so we are keeping like a creative white list for different communities they are opening uh, and they are we they are close to us and uh, it will be around uh, the the a concept that we, we want to really uh, highlight again we want to go back to our roots so our kind of rebellious uh, uh, mindset the fabricants start really to disrupting something and uh, i tell you what's happened when uh, when they appear in 2018, I was in, a, in my previous company, and I saw just a video, the first video that they published, and it was just uh, this uh, uh, digital gamma they was working, you know, super simple computer graphics, nothing crazy. But I say, what the fuck? <laughs> because because it was so disrupting that just the the decision to be fully digital on fashion they it's not the, it's not the same as uh, publishing wearables for a game it was really 
our collection is fashion, it's not game, it's fashion, and we want to be fully digital. We don't care about the fashion industry, the physical, and we want to make something new. I think uh, Warland is going back to that kind of, uh, at least as attempt, to go back to this kind of rebellion against, uh, let's say, the what's happening now that there are many amazing projects but i think we are kind of starting to conform a, a lot because we want to embrace everyone we want to have all the brands on board and to do that you, we need to compromise we need to go back okay we want to everyone happy in some way all the community everyone so what you're gonna see i cannot reveal much it's uh going back to our region to make something that has more punk attitude, more underground, and also we invite people to be part of this and not just uh, ourselves. It's not going to be just a self, you know, uh, I would say self reference. I think that's one of the uh, things that I've been loving in the space is that kind of like punk attitude. There is like, you know, a real kind of like underground vibe about it. And I don't know about anybody else that has been fortunate to kind of like go to events and you know so many other incredible cities but like London definitely has a thing going on it's insane here at the moment I think that's largely to do with kind of like you know the community that has kind of like been working together here but we also have our roots in kind of like this incredible kind of like creative heritage of like ID being born here, dazed being born here. And I'm, I'm really excited actually to see those guys kind of like coming into the space as well. Um, but one of the events I was thinking of was the last event that you worked on, or not the last event that you worked on, but the Vertical Crypto Art did here, um, Proof of People um, at Fabric Nightclub. Um, Ashimi, you've been doing like crazy amounts of things over the last 12 months. What are, what are some of the highlights? Uh, yeah, so we have actually been doing over the last 12 months, uh, actually even more so over the last six months, um, a lot of events. Um, and I think that's really just cemented for us, uh, like I mentioned before, how important it is for, for communities to come together to have this shared experience. Because what we have, you know, when we're sort of, we do a lot of um consulting with brands as well but of course we have a lot of exposure in the space because we run a creative production agency and we still do a, a lot of traditional uh campaign work for a lot of the big brands and a lot of the creative directors and photographers but i think what has always been kind of important is understanding that the jargon and technology that surrounds the space is still very confusing to a lot of people and when you do do when we do have events such as the Proof of People event, or also another event that we did called Picnic during London Fashion Week, which was specifically focused on digital fashion. Pe the, the, everything else in, on the technology side or the terminology side falls to the back end of, and, and the experience of, and the mechanics of actually walking people through how to immerse themselves in that space is really at the forefront. And that's always just been so, exciting to actually been a part of that and watch that. Um, one of the last projects that came out that uh, I was a part on, that I, that I was a big part of and I uh, curated over six months was with a marketplace called Bright Hall and their uh, Vogue Singapore's um, marketplace. In, uh, and we, I worked with four very big name fashion photographers, including Ellen Von Unearth, Nick Knight, uh, Chen Man and Liz Collins to bring, uh, well, to curate and bring some of their photographs as NFTs into uh, the Club Vogue Singapore space that launched uh, on Spatial. And this was just, it was an amazing project. And also, you know, working with traditional analog artists or, or, or um, creatives and bringing them into the space and also helping them leverage what the technology means and how much more of an audience they can reach is it was really just a great uh, project to be a part of and of course now there's a lot of other uh, photographers that kind of were part of that curation but didn't launch for this project that we're working on now uh, it's kind of an extension of also what it is we really do do at MAD is you know working with creatives um, and brand, of course brands but also creatives to from the traditional sense and just really demystify what the technology is about and help them use you know or go through like 
immense amounts of their creative archives and, and, and help them actually reach new audiences and new streams of revenue, of course, and show their work in, in new digital mediums. So that's, of course, a big part of what we've been doing as well. That's amazing. And I actually didn't know that you worked with Liz Collins on that. I love her work. Um, and really interesting to see what Nick Knight's been working on as well. Um, I was thinking like about fashion photography in particular because um, one of the criticisms of the space very early on was that we needed more curation. Um, and I think when you're looking at kind of like these historic archives, like you're saying, Ashumi, where, you know, essentially the back catalogue is huge. It's kind of like not all of it is kind of going to be right for this space or be interesting. So how do you kind of like, you know, draw from that as an influence and use it as inspiration, but do something to take you forward as a creator and an artist, not just kind of like mint out your back catalog or do that in a kind of a gamified way? Yeah, I, I'm, I definitely do think that curation is um, super important in everything uh, going into this space. It's It really is at the heart of um, the storytelling aspect, which makes such a big difference. And I think for this specific project, you know, showcasing work through a female lens was very important to me. Nick showed a piece, one piece of work, which is actually part of a bigger collection that he will be minting this month, uh, which is actually a 3D model of a um, model called Giselle that he worked with. So it wasn't traditional, actually, a photography um, uh, wasn't necessarily photography. But the, the three other photographers just had such a distinct point of view and such a distinct narrative for when I was kind of curating um, the collection for the specific drop. So I think just from, a, you know, fashion historically and, and in general has always been so tied and deeply rooted in the storytelling aspect as well. And that's really also from a brand perspective or from an artist perspective, so important in sharing the entire narrative when you're looking into the curatorial aspect of it. So I would expect that we are definitely full of a room full of people who have either worked in the fashion industry or are very connected to the space already. Um, so you'll all be kind of very aware of all the different kind of like creative processes and there's like so many, but one of them in terms of like publishing that you're working on James and like revolutionizing, <laughs> I don't know. I see that as like one of the most exciting spaces to play. Or media. It, yeah, just not not like the creation of like the physical garment necessarily or the um, digital asset, like in terms of AR, VR. I don't know. I feel like media in this space is super like game changing. Yeah, I mean. Because it is how you communicate. It's going to be the, like how you tell a story in a totally new way now. I think the biggest thing for that is that most media organizations, 95% are archaic. So there's so much room for disruption. Because this is why we like James on these panels, because he doesn't <laughs> like hold hole punches. Oh, yeah, come on, it's like, <laughs> we've, we've got it, but it's true though, right? And it's like, you can't, um, you can't deny, I'm not, because you've said that, I'm not going to mention names, but you can't deny that certain magazines that have become what I call supermarket magazines, like you really only buy them when you're in supermarkets and they don't really have that much of a community or an audience, even though they're a big name. Like they've got to convince their own staff that this is a good idea, let alone their audience. Like it's, it's hard, right? And I think for, it's, there's so much room for disruption. And I think it's really interesting because what we're seeing a lot of with what we do is this community aspect of media coming about where instead of it's like you were saying about the the fashion brands where it's like being dictated to a consumer it's the same thing where you've got like a media organization dictating what is said and then that's got like political and monetary like uh, viewpoints and, and and stuff adhered to it but when it becomes more community aspects like it becomes freer and um, so i think it's really interesting and it is a good it is a really interesting space but what i'm obviously more interested in a way is 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 merging digital and physical because through my career i feel like the moving to like a, an all web two model of like websites it's just a bit crap right like yeah cool like you can visit the verge and read about tech and read business insider and it kind of works in a sense but like if you want true creativity what you're just looking at a screen and it's flat and it's all just a bit yeah 
Um, and I really believe, I mean, it's funny because uh, when you look at somebody like, like I saw a story the other day and Kathy Hackle was in Vogue and Kathy Hackle, who's like godmother of the metaverse, right? Amazing, was amazing it lady. Was Vogue or Vogue Business? I think it was in Vogue Physical, right? And oh. she was holding up a co- uh, like her bit inside Vogue and she's really excited, yeah? And, but she's like, God, man, man, why is she so... It's because print holds such a big part of people's heart and it still does. And people, like we find, because we're print, right? Like we find that people get extremely excited. Like when we worked with Teflon Sega, he was so excited because it'd be like his first cover, right? And such a, um, so to me, you've got that tangibility and that excitement and that nostalgic but with the future of digital. So incorporating AR. And I, I still feel like my big mantra is that I want to enhance reality and not replace it. And like VR and metaverse, et cetera, you, you're kind of replacing reality a, a lot here. I personally think the metaverse will eventually just be AR. Like it is just digital enhancement on our reality. Um, and that's why I think that media really needs to take no, I mean, there's so much like media. Which, I mean, I'm just talking about like um, media organizations, but when we talk about advertising, we talk about billboards, we talk about, I mean, like maybe I'm going to give it away a bit, but like once with the new issue, we're going to do a, a billboard campaign, it will be AI. So then you can just like hold your phone to a billboard and it'll come to life and it'll be like digital in the street. And we already did it. We did it at, um, well, it was at, we are um, at W1 Curates. Yeah, W1 Curates and, and Flannels, where that, you know, they had the whole Flannels building digitized. And we just thought, well, let's just do that AR, right? We've got, we can do that. So we had, a, everyone had their like uh, artwork on the side of the building digitized screen on Oxford Street. And we pulled a 30 foot version of our cover. We have uh, uh, issue eight, we had Isabel Bermecki, a uh, nuclear energy influencer um, on the cover. And we just, we ported that into a 30 foot version off the side of the building. Like it's so much, there's so much to do. There's so much. And I think that, Obviously, the likes of Condé Nast and stuff are spinning up their own thing. I think what Vogue Singapore is doing is very good. I will actually I give them a lot of credit. I think what they're doing is great. But like, I don't think there's uh, there's not much movement in the needle. So uh, there's there's a hell of a lot of disruption to have, for sure. I was going to say I would just work with Harper's Bazaar in the UK for Freeze. They always do this amazing art issue every October, and they only feature female artists. And so I thought, like way back about six months ago, I was like, oh, that you know, they really need to feature a Web three female artist. So I sent them a whole load, and of course, it was Krista Kim that they kind of chose. Um, and it was super exciting. And Krista and her team are really excited to be working on the um, digital cover. Um, I was pushing for an NFT, like the first Harper's NFT, but they weren't quite ready for it. And I, you know, I'm not in the business of moving anybody into this space sooner than they kind of feel comfortable. It's like, otherwise, I think we're all sending them the wrong message, like that this is a rush or a hurry. It's like, it's not going anywhere. You can, we'll be here in a year's time when you're ready. You might be a bit late, but... <laughs> I mean, I did, to be honest with you, I actually really like that cover. I, I mean, obviously we'd have done very differently. We'd have done a lot of augmented reality with it, but, but just the fact that it's like the gradient as a cover, it's very cool. Uh, I think, is it still at Unit London, that piece of work? The Krista's, yes. uh, if you've totally got to go and see it. I had like a religious experience just watching that for like 10 minutes. It's amazing. It's really sublime. Um, so yeah, you can see it in Abigail's exhibition in our code at Unit around the corner in Mayfair. Um, we are kind of at time. I think we're going to open to questions. Um, and if you don't have questions, we're going to carry on chatting. So don't feel under pressure. But if you guys want to join the conversation, it, does anybody have a question for any of our panel at all? <gasps> Yay. Hi, when it comes to fashion and the value of, let's say, NFTs and social fashion. So the way I see it is Prado, Gucci, Balenciaga, whoever it is, the first time you can kind of pinpoint how the market views them as a brand. Because obviously as soon as it becomes transparent and the floor price is shown or how long you can hold them in specific items of clothing, they're very huge in the So I'm just wondering, in terms of that view of them previously dictating fashion for us, now we have the ability to dictate what we like to them. Whether you see any of the traditional houses dying as a result of basically that they having forced transparency when it comes to the what they've got in some of the back of the 
I was firstly, before you jump in really quickly, well done for repping your brand. Got the merch. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot what I was going to say now. Yeah. Um, I think there's two points, right? Which is, um, I like, th there's two transparency points. So there's transparency point you spoke about, I'll get to in a second. The other one is ownership between us, which I think is really interesting. Um, I, oh, I was going to say, I, I learned about, the McQueen were trying to do something. I, I don't think they've gone through with it. But they were trying to, what they were going to do is NFC tag all their garments, right? And then the idea would be that if you bought a McQueen jacket and then I bought it off you, like in resale market, and then Madonna bought it off me and then you bought it off Madonna, that jacket would be worth more than the jacket that like X person, Y person, because Madonna owned it, right? And it's such an interesting like transparency thing because you know who owned it and like how long they owned it for. And it's quite an interesting thing about resale and valuing that and in a thing. So that I find that interesting. Your question about big brands dying, yes. Like hundreds will die. And I, I genuinely believe that you, we will see a fundamental shift in who's at the top. Um, and I think what's exciting is that I hope Fabricant will be one of the, it'll be like Balenciaga, Fabricant, Cyber. Um, Gucci, whatever, right? Like, I, I hope, like, that's what will happen and you'll see a lot more of this shift. I think fashion brands are scared because of what you've just said. Suddenly they can't say, like, we are worth this. This is what we are. This is our price point. Like, uh, Belma is a good example, right? Their price point is superiorly high, not necessarily because of, like, their quality is extremely high. I'm not saying it's not, but compared to somebody else, on the, you know, their, their price point is higher because of that's what we've decided. And I think it's really interesting that the creator economy now now can decide the price point. So yes, I think that lots of brands will die. And I think that, I'm not going to mention them, but there's definitely been two or three that I can think of straight off the top of my head of huge brands, luxury brands that you've kind of mentioned or whatever, who have failed so far. And, um, and it's just the kind of navigation of how that will work in the future. I'm hoping that we'll just see more of a level, level playing field. Uh, and you'll get the independent designers will be able to like compete with the big houses at the same time. The same way there is a debt clock in New York that kind of like shows you all of the numbers of the debt we're racking up. There's going to be an augmented reality graveyard of all the brands that Cyber has said did not make it into the Web3 transformation. I'm not the voice of the whole decentralized <laughs> world. And another one that. bites the dust. Maybe we should do that. That'd be fun. Hey, it's ideas. It sounds like an extension of a like a dead fellas, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm carrying on from that question for Inara or someone with an agency background. I'm guessing clients come to you because they feel quite brave and quite bold and they're like, oh yeah, we're free, let's go. And how much of that actually translates into activation you're seeing and once you sort of reveal the world they go, Oh, not yet. Brands oh, are no. incredibly no. interesting. Um, no, no, no. Brands are incredibly interesting because they are not the originators of this movement. Like they did not come up with DAOs. They don't didn't want NFTs around. Like it's happening to them. So they have to be there in a defensive responding mode versus innovative. Let's come up with this stuff. So on the inside, there's I'm not going to say it's panic, but it's like, hey, this is happening. We shouldn't be ignoring it. But the machine, the way it's built is not designed to easily accept this system. It's not like they're saying, oh, transparency, sure. Let's just go from a moment of designing everything behind closed doors to having a massive fashion show of this massive reveal moment and let's invite our community to co-design. But that's just not natural for them. So they're trying to figure out how do they walk that tightrope and figure out how to not betray the Web3 values while also staying themselves. And I would love to meet these super eager clients you're talking about because I think <laughs> a lot of them have heard you know, from someone somewhere that they should be doing this. And a lot of them are in shopping around mode. They're just like, tell me what's out there. I'm gonna consider if I can do it. Then there's this beautiful thing that happens. Somebody on the inside of the company becomes a champion. And they're just like going around department to department. We should do this, we should do this. That can take months on end, um, no matter how enthusiastic they are. Once somebody somewhere bought that, like has that buy-in, that's when we become relevant because we take them through the story, but you can't push someone through the door that they don't want to walk through. There's also plenty of examples of things going really, really wrong. So because people have a brand that they've held up and maintained and created for so long, they don't want to see it fall flat to the face because we know Web3 cancels super fast. 
um, it's a difficult thing. So a lot of us also have our own projects. Like I have my own project because I need that outlet to be able to actually experiment with stuff that brands are simply not ready for. What they're ready for is vanilla safe solutions. Some of them might have the boldness of Nike and just say, we're acquiring a company that's already working. Brilliant. They don't really have to go through the process themselves. Um, but if you do decide to work with brands, I think you'll have something to say about that as well, is that a lot of digital fashion houses don't want to work with them and that they're doing their own thing. Um, so we'll see how that shakes out, but Fabricant made a pretty no, clear I, stance. I actually have two things to say. The first one is funny, is I episode a pizza restaurant chain that once contacted us to, because they want to make a full collection for their riders. So to deliver pizza, you know, but they want digital fashion for that. So it was a quite interesting episode. Now the second one, yes. No, we are open to all brands. That, that The main thing is that how much they are open. So how much they are open really to, to change, to change their mindset uh, against their customers again. It's not, uh, it's not about even uh, what they do specifically, but really the bi big first barrier is that one. I can tell you also that the idea of uh, revenue split, the idea of sharing with, uh, with many people. I tell you, we, we, are, we are in conversation now with one of the biggest celebrities in the world. <laughs> and they said, we were discussing about the revenue split for, for making, for working together. And they said, zero chance they were going to have a 50-50. They said, zero chance. They really, really like, a, you know who we are, why we should even consider. It's kind of this, uh, and this is the, the things that we want to see changes. It's not... Uh, well, we are open to everyone. We really like uh, our message. Apart the pizza restaurants, is maybe it's a, bit, <laughs> it's a bit on the edge of what is possible. But there are other ones who really we are we are really here to hear. For anybody who's read um, Snow Crash, the pizza restaurant digital fashion idea is not so bad. Just saying. <laughs> Just, Just saying. saying. <laughs> oh hey. Yeah, thanks for, because it's exactly one of the two things that we are more focused. One is this one, the other uh, uh, onboarding people. So the access to blockchain. But for this, we are really in build mode uh, working on, uh, let's say, I mean, everyone can promise automation, full automation. We are not doing that. We are semi-automate the process in a way that literally everyone can create a fashion from starting from close. But then all the steps that you mentioned and more, they are going to be optimized and automatically done. That's, uh, that's what we are working on in secret. Me, in my cave, and, and, my, and my team. I know Marco's the guy, but I just want to add something to that, which is, um, did you see, have you seen what artifacts have done with the 3D bubbles? Yes. No. And that's yeah, cool. that's, yeah, but like, have you seen that? Of what artifacts have done with the 3D files? Have you seen that yet? No. Okay, so like with the Clone X collection from artifacts, they dropped all the 3D files. So they, oh, you have a full avatar, right, with, with Clone X, right? So they dropped the 3D files for that with um, the garments that your Clone X is wearing. So everyone obviously got their different garments like, as part of the traits, right? Um, and then within, oh, I feel like it was within a week or two weeks, somebody made a plugin for Blend blender where it basically like you just put all your files in one folder you pressed merge and then you pressed like assemble and it would just assemble it all in blender for you automatically and that was pretty cool right and then people were loading all that into uh mixamo and, and back and forth right and designing it that way but then within three weeks the guy upgraded his plugin and now he's got lighting positions poses like all the different stuff and you just press buttons like so he's building and this is kind of what i'm talking about the creator economy right which is the artifact just release the files and then someone who's smart enough has made this plugin, which then enables the 10,000 people that own clones who haven't got a clue how to use Blender or, or Clo or Marvelous Designer to start playing around with it. 
And then a company, the like Artisan, have made a their own collection for the Clone X body. And we we've done the same. It's not released yet, but it, it, we have that it's made. Um, and so like we'll release our cyber fashion collection for the Clone X body. So then people can kind of play around with that. And I feel like it's gonna go that way where yes, you'll need a bit of knowledge. But I don't think you'll always it's, need to do the donut tutorial. You'll just need to like have a little bit of yeah. I don't know, right? That's our moment where we where we start uh, fighting on, on that conversation. <laughs> that's our moment. So basically, yes, I, I I mean, you know that I love artifact, but it's that way to combine things that are already made is different than the yeah, of design course, from course, scratch. Of course. Of course. So it, it's kind of it's a it, technically it's a way more simple pro, pro, process and problem still difficult. So really, 